All right. Well, it's good to be here this morning. We uh, have enjoyed this beautiful week, haven't we? Y'all have had it nice, and I enjoyed getting to go fishing again Friday and catch four more big bass, So, plus some other, but it was fun. I love fishing. But I love fishing. I love fishing for people who want to wake up. I, it saddens me on Facebook sometimes, and I understand it where somebody sees our posts and it's just, they're not there yet, and that's okay. We don't put people down. And I explained to one lady, you've got to hear the explanation because if you come in at the end of something, you haven't gone down the journey we've gone down, you, you know, you haven't seen the explanation of why we believe what we believe. And I say this again for everybody on Facebook or anybody that tunes in and listens to us. I'm going to turn this light off back here because it's glaring just a little bit there. If you're listening to our reading, I always encourage you to go back to the very first lesson on a series. You know, it's kind of silly to start on lesson 18 or 19. I mean, it's all right. It may be the first one you see, but you want to go back because that's kind of like waiting till the last two or three weeks of your algebra class to show up a class. <laughs> and then you take the test and you know, you don't, you don't understand it. And so that's what's going on in the world today. There's a lot of people who they get on Facebook or wherever and they look at, hear little statements and they just struggle with it because they haven't really gone through the class. So we encourage you, if you are going to follow us or any ministry, take the whole class, not just part of it, <laughs> right? You'll, you'll do a lot better. So we're continuing our study. We're in chapter six from No Penal Substitution. You know, we may title it something else when it's done. But uh, every, uh, every chapter I teach, I just hear more and more and more of it. What we're doing is re we're redefining what we were taught, and we're redefining what we believe. And we're doing that by allowing the Holy Spirit. We're listening to the Holy Spirit now. You know, people are saying, well, how are you coming up with all this? Or how are you seeing these things? Well, we finally learned to quit listening to our five sense realm and listen to our spirit. We had the Holy Spirit in us all along. But we listen to men whose breath was in their nostrils. And when I say men, most of the time there's no gender implied. But we were taught by people who are, get most of their information from the sense realm. And from now we see from mythology and a lot of stuff that, that affected our Bible. and affected what the prophets believe and even to this day what people believe. It's affected by mythology. One of them is it's a myth that God ever needed a bloody sacrifice or any kind of sacrifice. So we have believed a myth, haven't we? Same thing, we believe the lie. So, what, what does Paul mean at the end of Hebrews chapter 10? I hope you read those verses I asked you to read last night and uh, last week. Uh, when he said, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And we pointed this out last week. A lot of people are really tormented with that teaching because they've been taught once you've tasted the goodness of the Lord, once you, you've, uh, quote, got saved or whatever, and then you willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice for you. So we know that can't be true, because if that was true, every one of us, there would, you know, we would not be saved in the way the church calls saved. We would, have, we would be fearful all of our lives of dying, because we know we did this, or we did this, and we willfully did it. And said there's, But what he's talking about, we've got to remember this, he's talking to people that transition from the old covenant, the old sacrificial systems, to the new covenant. And he's explaining to them that, you know, if you willfully mess up, there is no more sheep for you to sacrifice. There is no more bloody offering because Jesus is the final one. You don't have to worry about a sacrifice. You do not have to sacrifice to please God anymore. How many times have we ever been told that what we've done is not pleasing to God? You ever heard that in your life about you? You know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think you ever heard it from me. I hope you never did. But we've all heard it. We grew up that way. Well, this isn't pleasing to God, you know. And we were always trying to please God, and so we did it with our own sacrifice. It was either praying more, coming to church more, giving more money, whatever it was we did. And it really didn't do anything for us whatsoever because God never did require sacrifice. So we want to glean from uh, verse 10, verse 14, verse 18 of chapter 10 in the book of Hebrews. And uh, I hope you're hungry. I would like to finish this. And you guys are students, so I know this is something that you'll probably... Give me a little bit more time if we can. I'll try to get to it as fast as I can. But verse 10, uh, there were some words that were, one word was added to it, the word the, and then some of them were out of order a little bit. But it says, by which, uh, by which will sanctified we are. 
you know, they put sanctified in the wrong place there, but it says, by which will sanctified we are through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, if you just read that the way the King James writes it, writes it you would think that the only way that we're sanctified is if we get saved, right? And we would think the only way that we are sanctified is by Jesus' offering. That Jesus, because we were taught all of our life that Jesus saved us, mm -hmm. Jesus made us whole, Jesus made us holy. In other words, implying that we were not holy, right? And implying that we were separate from God. So all of our life, we thought that's what that was talking about. But by which will sanctify we are, the word sanctified means in our awareness, in our awareness, we realize that we're holy. In our awareness, we realize that we're pure. And this is what I was looking up this morning and, uh, in, the, in the Greek and it, to confirm it, because I always want to confirm what I'm teaching and what I'm writing. It says we were consecrated in our awareness. What does it mean to be consecrated? Remember, the priests had to see something. They didn't do any of that sacrifice in the Old Testament, but they had to see something. And we use that as a physical picture that we need to see something. We need to see that God made us holy from the very beginning and we've always been holy. It also says uh, vindicate, which means to be in all, uh, to respect it, to be exalted as holy. So Jesus literally exalted us in our understanding of the fact that we are holy. And when you look it up, that says mentally. It says mentally holy, mentally pure, mentally consecrated. So that means we have to become aware of that, correct? Because we were not mentally. We had no understanding of that in our lives. So the, so the entire epistle of Hebrews uh, is about Jesus Christ being the once and for our sacrifice and that God never required sacrifice and he never wants us to sacrifice again. And I'm telling you, that produces such freedom to me. And I don't, And we're not talking about bloody sacrifices. But a sacrifice could be doing anything that would... Uh, Donna, would you let Carl and Ann know that we're in here? They're just driving up. I think that's them driving up. No, we'll see. Huh? They'll hear you. The door's not open, though. Um, a sacrifice to us is doing anything to try to please God. So what would that be, Lisa? Quit. I'm, I'm going to quit eating ice cream. Right. You know, that's one thing we're... All, the, the big thing that bothers all the time is our, our, our slip-ups that we do that we have been taught that's been drilled into our heads that it's wrong. And so our thought is, well, I'm, I'm gonna, Lord, I'm going to quit this. I'm, I know I'm going to quit this. Lord, I'm going to be better, right? And so all that's a sacrifice. Thinking God wants us, and yes, God wants us to live good lives, but once we discover these truths, like I put on Facebook, the only sin is not knowing who I am, and once I discover who I am, all that stuff will go away. Once I discover the Prince of Peace lives with inside of me, I won't go to anything for peace or comfort. Amen? Amen. So there's no more sacrifice or repentance due by anyone. We're, we're not criticizing anyone. I'm not criticizing the Catholic Church or the Pentecostal holiness or anything, but the truth is there will be no more five Hail Marys. There will be no more Our Fathers. There, 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 there won't be any more fasting to try to get God to do something. There, there will be no more repentance. There will be no more asking forgiveness. And that really is rocking a lot of people's world right now. But why would I have to ask for forgiveness as God, if God doesn't hold anything against me? And He never has held anything against me. So, uh, as far as God's concerned, there's only one thing, family, and it's at, at one moment. Not atonement. Atonement means somebody has to pay a price, or there was a price paid for you. But there's nothing but at one moment. We are one with God, and that's it. Uh, you know, all three of my children live different lives. All three of my children, I'm sure, have done some things that the church would call sin. I'm sure they have, <laughs> you know. I'm sure there's things that they maybe have done against me or said things to me that hurt me or I've hurt them or whatever. But the fact is we're still one. You can't, you know, I hear that, I'll say that all the time to you guys, but it's a fact we're still one. Nothing can, can divide us asunder whatsoever. And so, you know, the Bible says when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about their laws and stuff and they were talking about marriage and they were bringing up to marriage and a woman couldn't leave a husband and they were talking about divorce and everything. Well, the picture of, of male and female getting married is the spirit, the, the mind of Christ, and the conscious awareness of man being one. 
the, or the soul of man, because we're a soul, being one with the spirit. And Jesus said, let no man put asunder what God has joined together. But what did God join together at the beginning? His mind, right? And man, he joined, they, he made, the two became one. So that picture of a married couple is not so much teaching about marriage, it's talking about us. And yet men who live out of the five sense realm have spent most of their life trying to divide asunder us, right? They showed us, hi guys, they showed us as separate. They showed us as divided one another. But Jesus said, don't let anybody do that. Don't do that. But I have to tell you, much of my teaching when I was younger was exactly doing that. Because if somebody was doing something wrong, I, in my teaching, it made them feel separate from God. You know, I laugh about it all the time. I've shared it with you about me writing that teaching on cussing. You know, and I was talking about how if you cuss that you're, you, you know, I, I don't want to say that you were a sinner or whatever, but all those things in my mind made you separate from God. And Jesus said, don't let anybody do that because we're one and you cannot be separate at all and you can't be any closer than one. So what Jesus again was doing was, was trying to bring this, this, these religious people away from their mythical uh, and their false sacrifices by being this last this last one, this last sacrifice. If you've got to have a sacrifice again, I'm the last one. And see, sacrifices produce, again, thinking that I'm separate. Right? That's an important thing for you to think of. Are you wanting to read something? Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought you was pointing to something. No, I was just thinking you should tell Ann Carl that we're in Hebrews 10. Oh, Hebrews 10. I'm, thank you. Hebrews 10. We're going to go to 14 right now. But, but I want to really get this across to you because we need to meditate and we need to think about this. When, when people tell us they need to do something to please God or I need to, I, I need to start coming to church. Well, why do you need to come to church? Are you coming to please God or are you coming to learn? Are you coming to fellowship with people that, that want to help you grow and understand? So if you're trying to do something to please God, then you're offering a sacrifice and God says, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't need it. Now Hebrew 10, 14. For by one offering he hath protected, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So what is hath? It's past tense, right? So there again, why didn't we ministers read this that says it was all done by that one offering? We didn't, I, don't, I, don't under, I just don't understand me. I don't understand how I didn't see that. But I do understand because my brain again, was so pounded with the opposite of that. My brain was so pounded that I wasn't right with God. So bless God, I'm not going to let you feel right with God. I mean, I didn't do it that way, but that's what came out. But one offering, there's only one offering, and he has perfected. And we, we read for Anna and Carl, because they just walked in, and the first part of uh, this is that, that Jesus was waking us up to who we are. The, the word, let me back up here so you'll get this. It said he sanctified us, but that word sanctified was make us in our awareness understand that we're holy. Make us in our awareness that we've been consecrated. Make us in our awareness that we've been set apart, and we always were. Okay? He didn't, it didn't become true just because Jesus went to the cross. It already was true. So what are our three things that we say Jesus did? He showed us the character and the nature of the Father, Right? And then he came to do away with the sacrificial system, and he came to remove that which hindered man. And that was the degenerate nature activity that produced all kinds of false beliefs and also all kinds of lack, a sense of lack in all five realms of life. And Jesus came to do completely do away with that. So the New King James Version of verse 14 says, He has perfected forever them that are being sanctified. So we have past. And we have being, it's present progressive. Well, sanctified again means holy, right? It means consecrated. Well, that is a being thing in our lives, not that we're not that way, but it's a present progressive understanding. Just because I say it to you one time doesn't mean you're going to believe it, does it? So what we do is we allow our Holy Spirit to shine more and more light on our Bible, on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the Old Testament pictures. You know, a lot of people say we don't need the Bible anymore. Well, I beg to differ. We do. But we need to listen to our Holy Spirit as we study the Bible. When you hear preachers preach, you need to bring that through the love of God. The filter is the love of God. 
So when I read my Bible again, if it doesn't fit the love of God, then I know it's a, it's a, it's a, a, mytho, a mythological belief, it's a paganistic belief, or it was translated wrong, or it was added to. Those are the four things that we need to understand there. So when we look this verse up in the Greek, we find the phrase them, that, to mean he, she, they. So the phrase are sanctified, again, translates made sacred uh, in our awareness, holy, and morally blameless in our awareness. Then when you are aware of that and you slip up and you go eat too much ice cream, you can say, so I'm redeemed. I'm still redeemed. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. However, there are conse uh, consequences, but they don't come from God. Amen. You know, people tell me all the time, well, if, if all this is true, then people are just going to go do what they want. And they'll never, and I, I say, well, unless they're totally, their brain is totally seared, you know, if they don't care about life or whatever, hopefully they will learn from their consequences and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yes. You know, God doesn't send us those things so we can learn. But as Donna was telling me yesterday, and we were talking about, you can, st you can learn from things if you're not, your brain's not completely seared. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many have ever touched fire and it burnt your finger? Yes. Well, did you go touch it again the next day? No. Never. The next, any other time, it was probably an accident, you know, a curling iron. You know, I think women are funny. I see women all the time with burns up here. They don't learn. They need to invent some other way of curling your hair. <laughs> so y'all don't learn very well, do you? But, but it's, it's important for us to understand that. So, what did you say? I did. I quit. I know. Just, just <laughs> quit doing it. Quit it. So that's what that's what I like about that uh, counseling session. We saw that comedy where the guy said, "Stop it!" You know, I mean, my lord, you 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 you're taking drugs. You're sick all the time. You've got, you know, you're in a mess, and you come for counseling. All you need to hear is quit it. Right. You know, but they need to be told how they can stop. Yeah, it was stop. That's what he said, wasn't it? So this is what we can say then: by Jesus being the once and for all offering, He hath awakened and brought forth an awareness to us of our character forever he, she, they are sanctified, holy, and morally blameless. Man, if we could live that way, what would it do for us? And I have to tell you, and I believe you're the same way, we still struggle in our brain with, you need to quit this, you, if, you, if you were doing this, or if you were doing that, you know, it would be a, it would be a lot of problems. Donna, there's a, a flower car driving up wanting to deliver some flowers, and he's going to walk in because the door's open, so you're going to have to receive them for him. Thank you. But if we, could, if we could just grasp hold of that, what a freedom we could have. A freedom to do what? A freedom to enjoy our lives. A freedom to, uh, to talk with our Father, not be ashamed. Yeah. A freedom to go forth and help other people with no condemnation, no judgment. Recognizing where they're at and just gradually allow the Holy Spirit to give you things to say to them to wake them up more and more and more. This is the freedom that will change the entire world. Yes. When you hear this, there will be no minister that can preach anything other than that. There will be no minister that tells you that you need to go out and kill people because they don't believe what you believe. Yeah. Right? And there will be no people that can cause you to talk about other people or condemn other people. It just brings great freedom to us. So verse 10 in the King James Version says, By which we are, past tense, holy, sacred, and morally blameless. And then the New King James Version says, uh, uh, We are being. So we realize we're always at one with Father God. The being part is the constant revelation of that. And never needed forgiveness. Boy, did I get some flack on that last week. <laughs> But a lot of people understood it. A lot of it really woke people up, and a lot of people know it already. We never ever needed forgiveness. We, you know, that's what filled the altars, I guess, with people coming down mm -hmm. pleading. And I can tell you, I remember the days that I would cry out to God, just cry out for forgiveness, and I never felt forgiven. Never. Why? Because the messages keep coming forth, making me feel okay. Something else I need to get forgiven of. Something else I'm not doing right. It was always me not doing enough. So the incarnation of Jesus revealed what was always true about us from the very beginning of time. You find that in 2 Timothy 1.9. You find it in Ephesians 1.4. When we came here, we simply forgot who we were. And that kind of seems weird, didn't it? When I first heard that several years ago, I thought, that, that's kind of odd. But we, we did, man as a whole. 
And when we were birthed today, our parents did not teach us the truth. I was meditating on that out in my backyard this morning. Just, oh, if every parent can hear this. When you give birth to that child from the very moment that it can begin to understand, you can begin to teach them that their creator is nothing but love and their creator never ever will have anything against you. That you are the prince of this earth and you have a spirit and this is how to live out of your spirit. Man, we can live so much different. Yes. Things could change tremendously for us. So the, this incarnation brought this realization and that's why I always like the verse that says that we can receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save or rescue our conscious awareness. That engrafted word is the truthful word. It's not, it's not just reading the Bible but it is the truthful word. And so this incarnation is important for us to understand. That's why the ministry of our Holy Spirit is not only to lead us and to guide us in all truth but to bring us back to our remembrance. And so it might not hurt us to start saying, Father, help me remember who I am. Father, remind me. You know, I'm going to listen to you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to listen to your voice. And remind me when accusing thought comes or anything comes to me, help me to remember who I am. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, my gosh, if I am heir to a wealthy family and they all love me, and I forgot, I'm like, would you help me remember? Yeah. Isn't that kind of like the part of a prodigal son? Yes. The dad wouldn't even listen to his excuses. He just welcomed me back. And see, that, that's what people need to understand, that Father God is here with his arms wide open, just, hey, I, I have got nothing against you. Let's fellowship. Learn more of me. And I want to fellowship with you. So Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and when he told him that a man must be born again, and that's where people keep saying, well, what about, what about that? Well, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross at that time. And what happened, Nicodemus had forgotten uh, who he was, and he could not be, it could not be revealed to him until Jesus' resurrection, because they, they weren't, if you were revivified, they weren't, the spirit wasn't been pushed forward in them where they can understand. But see, the words born again in Aramaic means to remember your beginnings. In Aramaic, it means to remember your beginnings. That's all it is. Jesus said a man must remember where he came from. And that's what Jesus was here to do, to help us to remember that. So even though grace was not re uh, fully revealed in the Old Covenant, it was still apparent and it was still experienced. Grace was always there. Our Father has always been a Father of grace. Uh, you, you can look in the Bible, but you'll see, in the Bible, you'll see Noah found grace, right? And as you look through there, I found 18 references. Joseph found grace. Moses found grace. Samuel found grace. And many others found and experienced the grace of God even in the Old Testament because the grace of God never stopped. He was always there. I always say if Adam wouldn't have made all those excuses and just said, Father, I, I messed up. And he would, God would just say, that's all right. Just keep following me. I'm going to get you through it. But what do we do? We made excuses. And then we brings self-condemnation into our life and self-condemnation makes you pull away you know if, if again if you and I say this often I'm sure but if you feel like uh, you've done something to offend me well one of the greatest ways is Norma borrowed some money from me and she was supposed to pay me back next week and she last week and she didn't she was going to pay me back again and she didn't what does it cause her to do it kind of divides the the relationship I have a renter that Never, she speaketh with a forketh tongue a lot. <laughs> and she'll always tell me, I'm going to pay you this day, I'm going to pay you this day, you guys know that. But next thing you know, she doesn't, re doesn't answer the phone, and she doesn't uh, answer my text. I mean, she pays me late. But, but that, that causes her to not want to talk to me. Right? right? And so that's what our belief system, that we've done something that can separate us from God, it causes us to pull away. God never pulls away. No. Ever. So, John 1.17 in the New American Standard reads, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Now, two things are very important in that verse. They put the word but in there, but it was italicized. If it's in your Bible, it's probably italicized because it was just added there. The word but is a conjunction joining two different thoughts together. So, for example, the law was given by Moses, but 
Well, if you put but, the grace came by Jesus, then it implies that there was no grace in the Old Testament. But there was. Grace was always there. Our Father was, is always a Father of love. And grace is our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is what God did to wake us up to who we are. And so mankind had simply forgotten the grace of our loving Father. And therefore, what have we done? We've prayed for more grace. We've sought more grace, haven't we? And then we've been taught that mercy is not giving us what we deserve, and grace is giving us what we don't deserve. How many of you heard that? I saw it in one of our school classes in the college. Somebody was using a book that's teaching people that, and that's the furthest from the truth of the grace of God. You know, so we don't we don't want people to think they have to earn grace. It was not brought by Jesus. It was not brought by Jesus. It was revealed by Jesus. That makes the big difference. Yes. See, our entire six steps of the throne that we've taught since 1996 ourselves, and Brother Garner has to be updated because it it implies that. You know, without Jesus, you're just a wretched sinner. Without Jesus, you're forever uh, law bound and going to go to some hell forever and forever and forever. And that's totally contrary to the truth of what God says. You were always redeemed. You can live a horrible life on this planet. You can do horrible things. And when you die, you're still going to be with the Father. But that, see, that's what makes people mad because they've been taught that heaven is our reward, right? I was taught all my life if I give my tithe and, and my offerings that there would be money waiting for me. Any, anybody ever hear that? That you would have all kinds of riches in heaven. I guess that you're paying on your mansion, evidently. <laughs> and so here comes more money, so Jesus gets to go put another room in your mansion, you know. And it, it's just ridiculous, but that's what we were taught. And uh, furthest from the truth. It's quiet in here. <laughs> Feels like a funeral home. <laughs> it is a funeral home. Wake up, wake up. So verse 10 says it is done. And verse 14 says we experience what is already done. That's, that's, what it, that's, that's what it talks about here. It was finished from the foundation of the world. So what Jesus did has nothing to do with what we do today. It has everything to do with what God did. And guess what? God chose us. We didn't choose God. You can't choose God. If man was dead in their trespasses, if man was not living out of their spirit, which we know they weren't, and we know most of us after the cross have not been living out of our spirit, but if they were dead in their trespasses, dead means no awareness with God, then how can they choose God? How can they? How can a person today that the church world calls sinners, wretched sinners, how can they do anything, that, how can they, if they have no spirit, which I used to teach many years ago, and, and the church teaches, and the charismatic church teaches, you don't get the Holy Spirit until somebody lays hands on you. Right? So how can they ever come and choose God the way we were taught? They can't. God chose to wake us up. God chose us from the very foundation of the world. God created man. Man didn't create God. And I hear lots of people say that we create our God. Well, we created false gods, right? Mythological gods. We created our Pentecostal holiness gods and our Baptists and our Lutheran and our Methodists and our Islam, our Buddhists. We create, but nobody created the true and living God. Amen. God is spirit. Amen. And there I'm praying, God, help us understand what it means by God is spirit. Because we know God is not a physical being, but God is in us. And the Bible says, ye are gods. Right? So we need to understand this. So, let's see. Let me get, skip a little bit because I've got a lot to teach here today. Carl, are you, are you, are you up to it? Are you awake? <laughs> I wasn't awake uh, Saturday morning. I, I guess you all know I didn't show up. Didn't you? <laughs> I was pretty tired. <clears throat> Okay, so what God did excludes no one whatsoever. That's one thing we got to, it, it excludes, it's all inclusive. All inclusive. His creation was, he created everyone. Everyone is his children. Everyone belongs to God. All men are in Christ, whether they're dead to that, whether they're asleep to that, or whether they're alive to that, everybody is in Christ. We don't need to go out and get people saved so they can be placed in Christ. We need to go forth and preach the real good news and help wake people up to who they are already. 
Just like in America, people that are here need to be awakened to the freedom and the choices they have and the right to pursue happiness. And we need to wake people up because too many people are dependent on the God government. Yes. Too many people are dependent on the God welfare. That becomes their God. Yes. The medical industry becomes a God. We have got to work, we go to the doctors more than we learn how to live out of, you know, and I'm not condemning anybody. Uh, I've got to have some surgery on my shoulder and I'm not there yet where I can just say, be gone arthritis. I, I, I know I can, I'm not there yet, and I need some help until I can. But we've allowed them to become anti-Christ or anti-God to us. And I believe we do need to get to the place, and we will. It may not be us, we may not see it, but I do believe there will be a generation that's going to rise up and walk above all the systems of the earth, and it's going to change. And you think, well, wow, that's too big. How can that happen? Well, God's a big God. Right? He's a big God. So Jesus drew all into him, which includes man. And when we awaken to this point, we come into this realization of pers persuasion, then that we experience it. And the experience, the experience comes from knowing that you're holy, you're set apart, and you're morally pure. And you're clean no matter what it looks like on the outside. You already are. Now verse 18, Hebrews 10, 18. So Paul was redefining the idea that if one sins willfully, it's over for you. And to clarify again, for somebody that may have just come to the video or you guys just walked in, I think I said it last week, but what he's talking about, the old sacrificial system is over with. And Jesus did the end of that. So if you do something willingly, which we concluded last week most people do, there's nothing you can do to please God He's still pleased with you yes. as to who you are. He's not pleased that you're doing those things, but you're still redeemed. There's nothing you need to do. You need, just need to say, you people and the old sacrificial system, you people need to say, Jesus was enough. And we people afterwards should have already known it. We should have never sacrificed to God ever. Okay, Hebrews 10, 18. Now the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The Greek rendering of that is now where freedom stands, there's more, no more need for offering for error. So when you're, you're living in this freedom and you're feeding from a tree of life ministry that makes you stand firm in the things of the gospel, there should never be a mindset that you need to offer something for your mistake. Am I saying you're never going to have a mistake again? No. Uh, there will come a time when we fully learn to live out of our spirit that we'll walk totally free from that. But I'm not saying just because I read this to you that next week Carl's not going to go out and mess up and go have a donut. Or two or three or four or five. <laughs> <laughs> now you're meddling. But now, you don't, yeah, now I'm meddling. But you don't have to... Now you may have to go to Ann and say, what can I do? <laughs> but you never have to go to God and say, what can I do to please you because I know you're not happy with me anymore. Isn't that good? That's good. I just like to meditate on that a long time. Yeah, because there's a lot of people out there that think that God's mad at them. Sure too they bad. do. Sure they do. You know, I've, done, I've been too bad. I've thought it. Of course. You know, and, I, and I've said this many times, and I love how some of my brethren on Facebook write me and encourage me, and I, I'm not beat up now, but... You, you, again, you don't think that I have this little small amount of people here and what happened at our other church and I don't have this thoughts come up here, there's something I did, you know? You know, like Brother Hibbert used to say, there's Ichabod written over my door now. <laughs> the glory of God has departed. You know, I heard that all my life. And so there's those thoughts that are still there that there's something I'm doing wrong. I know it's not true. I know it, but I'm just saying it's there so I know there's stuff in you. Because I'm this great guy, so... <laughs> No, it all it happens to all of us. Yes. But now I do, I, I just, I cast down that vain imagination. Yes. God has nothing against me. There's nothing I could do that can separate me from my calling. No. Nothing. I can't, and I'll tell you what, I have tried to get, I've had thoughts of just quitting before. I've, I've had thoughts of getting off the internet and just teaching you guys and write, but I just say, I can't do it. It's like Jeremiah, I can't, I can't stop it. There's just like fire shut in my bones. And if only one of you shows up, I'm going to cheat you. Because my wife will be here, so there will be two or three. <laughs> right? 
So what question are we answering? They said if you sin willfully, there's no more sacrifice for you. We found the perfect sacrifice once and for all, Jesus Christ. That's the question we're answering. So uh, based on the last two verses, verse 18 is a statement that it is, it is completely opposite from what most evangelical uh, uh, preachers preach when they say, if you sin, bless God, you're done for. You're done for. But I've never seen one time where they, they don't give them something that they can do. Have you? They'll teach that fear, but they, but they want to keep them and they want to control them. And so they give them something they can do. And uh, based on those verses, we've got to understand this. Verse 26 seems to say, if you do willfully sin, there's nothing you can do about it. You've gone too far. You've overstepped it. But see, that's Paul is saying, this is not true. When he writes that, he said, this is, this, this is not true. Nothing can separate you from God. Nothing. Now, we were discussing this this morning, Don and I, you know, the old sacrificial system, man, you had to sacrifice every year. There's this one at the end of the year, but there's sacrifices all the time. And can you imagine what that was like? Over and over. It was bloody. Brother Garner used to talk about how much blood flowed. I mean, it was a, it was a massive butcher that went on constantly. And it was ne and so Paul's coming along and he's giving them the good news. Guys, you don't have to do that no more. And the fact is, you never had to do it. What a revelation that was for Paul, man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he followed the law. He understood it all. I mean, he was involved in the sacrificial system. He helped the cope by Stephen was stoned because of the law. I mean, this guy must have had a great awakening. Had to be very excited. I'm going to go out and win the world. And what did they do? They wanted to kill him. They stoned him. They cut his head off. Went to Rome, they cut his head off. Just because you have this a truth doesn't mean everybody's going to love you. <laughs> the people who are hungry will. I hope. <laughs> so no more Hail Marys, no more Our Fathers, no more confession of sin, no more asking to be forgiven. Well, people say, well, but in one of John's books, it says if we sin, we need to confess our sins. Well, when you look at the word confess, guess what it means? It's logos. It's the word of God. So when you do something that you think is sin, when you, you know, you can just say, well, the Word says I'm still redeemed. The Word said there's nothing I can do to separate me from God. Nothing. Anybody think of anything that you, you can do to separate you? From? Now, you can do things to, to give you a sense of separation. But with this mm -hmm. understanding, you will not even have a sense of separation. So what do I do, Pastor? Because I still have some struggles. I still mess up. Just keep feeding. You know, I called my dentist a week ago, and I said, you know, uh, my jaw is swelling. You know, I had that infection. They did that root canal. They're going to do another one on the 15th in there. Look, that's, it didn't hurt, but it's just not fun laying there for an hour with your mouth open. But I, I called them a couple of times, and they said, just keep taking your antibiotics. You'll be okay. And the, the lady that I think one lady got a little tired of it. I called her and, and uh, I told her, I said, it's really hurting up here. And she said, Roy, you're going to be okay. <laughs> so when I went to have it done, I said, Colleen, I'm not a hypochondriac. It's just been beating in my head with my knee. I can't have any infections. But, they, but their answer was, keep taking your antibiotic. It's going to be okay. And see, that's what we need to tell people. Let's don't deal with your your alcoholism. Let's don't deal with your drugs. You know, yes, I want to, I'll help you, but I'm telling you, you can, you can be break, you can be made free from that. Just come on, keep coming, keep feeding. It's going to be okay if you'll feed. Hasn't that been true with us? Yes. Not that you guys were doing anything horrible. I think the only one was maybe Lisa, but <laughs> no. But I, I know things have changed in our lives. And I know the truth has made us free from a lot. And it doesn't have to be any horrible, what the church calls sin. It can just be an attitude about other people. Yes. Right. That's a big one that has helped me. And I don't look at anybody and put any judgment on them whatsoever. The, the fact that I know now that there's no coming judgment has freed me from that. Now I'll never go to somebody and say, why don't you get saved so you don't have to face a mean and angry God someday? Never have to say that again. Ever. 
I can treat them like who they are. When, when women call me and they, on, on Facebook, and a lot of them do, and talk to me about their husbands, and their husbands aren't, quote, saved, and, you know, they're not. And I tell them, you know what you need to start doing with them? Just treat them like they are. Treat them righteous. Yes. And it's like a light goes off. Almost every one of them. Wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> we did treat them as though they are who they are. Yes. If you're studying the Bible, go to them and say, Honey, you know, I don't understand what this means. Can you help me with it? How do you think that would affect a man that's all his life been treated like he's just a sinner? Mm -hmm. Treat them righteous. Treat them holy. If they're not loving you enough, treat them like they do love you. Thank them. It's not lying. See them. See the end from the beginning. I thank you that you, you treat me so good, honey, <laughs> with your big black eye that you got. And no, <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding there. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just saying, see people, seeing people the way they really are, that's a freedom that I have yes. got from this message. It's really helped me tremendously. Uh, see. So, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. There's no more sacrifice for what man thought needed to appease an angry God. Whatever you're doing, it's doing nothing. Whatever you're doing to please God, it's doing nothing. If you've been taught to give your money to please God, it's doing nothing for God because God doesn't need it. Now, yes, give, help pay your church bills. If you're in a place that has a, a, a lot of bills and a mortgage, you should be giving. You should, should be, you should be supporting your fellowship. But you're not giving it to God, you're giving it to your fellowship. Your pastor's not going in the back with all the money, throwing it up in the air, letting God get what he wants, and the rest that falls down goes to the church. That's not happening. So... I lost a lot of people right there. <laughs> but thank God I'm free. Yeah. That's my answer. Thank God I'm free. Thank God you're free. Thank God you're free. So Paul was telling these Hebrew believers there's no need for repentance, asking for forgiveness, repentance, giving a sacrificial offering, or anything else. That all came from mythology, every bit of it did. Jesus' work took away the first to establish the second. He took away the old sacrificial system to, sac to, to establish the fact that we were forever, see, established means establish it in your understanding that we were forever holy and we never lost our holiness. We were forever one with God. We never lost our oneness with God. Now I want to read a few things to you. Uh, and I, I know I said it last week and some, some of you cringed, but you've got to see in the Bible where these, these sacrifices to, of humans took place. Have any of you ever read it very much in the Bible? It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Old Testament. And God was coming to the children of Israel trying to stop them from doing that and these people. And here's a few examples of it. I won't go into detail. Just what it says here. In Jeremiah 32 35, you can just write it down. 32 35. 32, 35 it says, And they built the high places of Baal B-A-A-L, which was a false god, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnon, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch. Now that's just a real nice way of saying they burned to death on the arms of that God. Which I commanded thee not. I didn't tell you to do that. Neither came into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And then uh, kings uh, of King Ahaz, speaking of Ahaz, A-H-A-Z, it's in 2 Chronicles 28.3. It says, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abomination of the heathen whom the Lord hath cast out before the children of Israel. And Anne, I see your face, and we think how disgusting that is, but how much have we burnt our children? Mm -hmm. How much have we condemned people to hell? Mm -hmm. For Like I read about what John Cahill said last week, did they not burn that lady? The, the lady that had fixed herself up? Mm -hmm ended up in a mental institution, they, they offered her to their perception of God because she cut her hair and put makeup on and nylon hose and made herself look pretty that she had lost her salvation and she was going to go to hell. That's the same thing. really is. Isaiah 57, 5, inflaming yourself with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock. They literally threw their children over cliffs. Killed their children. So what have we done with religion? What's going on in the world today with religion? Listen, look what radical Islam's doing. By the way, President 
Trump signed into law that I can make political statements now and I don't have to worry about it. But I didn't worry before, did I? <laughs> but that, that's, what, that's what's going on today. They're, they're cutting people's heads off. They're killing people mm -hmm. trying to appease their God, trying to earn seven virgins. Whatever it is they're trying to earn. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're even today, if, if somebody does a terrorist act and kills people and they go to prison, they pay their family millions of dollars while they're in prison. That's their reward for what they're doing. Same thing. Jeremiah 7.31, And they have built the high places in Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart. Ezekiel 16.20-21, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed to them to be devoured, these are the children of Israel. To be devoured, is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? That thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass to the fire for them? Ezekiel 23, 39, For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary. Same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine own house. That's pretty indicting, isn't it? But yet, the church has done the same thing. They've sacrificed people mentally. They've sacrificed people physically. They've killed people because, just like I said, the Catholic Church killed all, all the Protestants they could because they didn't believe the way they did. And then we did it in our churches by condemning people to eternal hell. We've got to stop that. <laughs> We've got to hear the truth. The list could go on and on and on. The way you did. Huh? I said because they didn't believe the way you did. That's right. So these false beliefs carried all the way into the writings of the prophets. Uh, the, uh, it ended up in the, the many versions of our Bible. You know, I have people call and write me wanting to know what version of the Bible to read, and I can't tell you. You know, I, I know there's some out there that have some good truth. The Message Bible, I've read a lot in it. There's other ones, but they still have their mixture in it. The King James... Again, the only reason I use the King James is because that I know of, I can go back to the original text and find out what it means. But I'm not a King James only preacher. That makes people mad when I say that. But I use that to translate from. So the only Bible I know to listen to is our Holy Spirit. And But use your Bible, read it, because that's all we have. But there again, allow the Holy Spirit to shine the light yes. of the gospel on that. The light of God's love. And again, if it doesn't fit God's love, then we don't want it. You know, our Strong's reference is the same thing. He was influenced by mythological beliefs because when he translated the word, then he added what he thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing happened there. So the Bible says no man has seen God. Well, no man with their, that lives out of the sensory realm has seen God. But we're no longer doing that. We're men who's learning to live out of our spirit. Yes. And we're seeing God, and God is nothing but love. Mm -hmm. So Hebrews 10.27. I'm almost done. I thought it would take longer. Am I going too fast? Is that what's wrong with <laughs> Hebrews 10, 27. And I've read this before, but we're just explaining it now. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, and adversaries are people. So, again, that sounds like what the evangelical ministries do today because they preach an eternal hell that people so readily preach and they believe it, so it causes a constant fear of coming judgment. I have done things in my life that caused me to fear judgment. Have any of you? I have. All of us have. Either not doing something we should be doing, or doing something we knew we shouldn't have been, and it caused a fear of coming judgment. I was raised, and I don't know so much that my mom and dad did it, but I always had this belief as a young man that if I had committed some kind of sin and I died and didn't ask God to forgive me, that I'd go to hell. I'm telling you, we didn't allow ourselves to think this way, but literally we should have thought, boy, that's a mean God. And that's why people today don't want the gods that people are preaching. That's why people, again, like I said last week, I understand why my son says, I don't believe in God. Because the only God he was taught is the God of mythology. 
the God of paganism. And boy, that's hard for people. And I know you're out there getting mad at me and you're getting mad at Kay and other, but, but it's the truth. There's only one God, and that God is nothing but love. And if you're preaching a God that's anything but love, you're not worshiping the right God. If you're preaching a God that's going to take billions of them and has taken billions of them, billions of them, billions of people, and they're burning on hell in hell right now, that God is not a very good God. But you know what? There are people right now that would hear that, that would get so angry because that's the God, the only God that they know. They've never met the true and living God. They've never known the love of God. The love of God. I love that song we played here several weeks ago. The love of God. There's nothing like the love of God. Unconditional. No need to earn it whatsoever. That, that's love. I, I really enjoy reading things on Father's Day and Mother's Day on Facebook when people talked about how their parents never showed them anything but love. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's all you ever got out of your parents was love. So what Paul wrote in verse 27 is he is agreeing. Is, is he agreeing with that? What the reality of that is? No, he's redefining it. He's redefining it. He's saying this is what you believe. This is what they wrote in those days. This is their perception of God, but it's not true. It's not true whatsoever. And Paul already presented the reality, verse 10, 14, 18, that we are saints and we have always been saints and we will wake up more and more to the fact that we are saints. Saints mean holy. So the mythological false sacrificial system ended here. And the Old Testament understanding was if a person stole something, they had to pay something back and add a percentage to it, right? Well, that wasn't God. We thought it was because that's how they wrote it. But that it was them adding, adding to what they believed. Therefore, the writers explain uh, the, the untruthful word. And we need writers that can explain the truthful word. We need teachers that can explain the truthful word of the gospel. So verse 27 reveals people's awareness that believe in penal substitution. Penal substitution means somebody dies on the behalf of somebody else. Or you, it can be sacrifice. You do something on behalf of you to appease an angry God. And there's a tremendous amount of people that believe that and teach that. So the real message of the Word of God is fear not. Fear not. I, I, I think I mentioned, did I mention it to you all last week? Okay. It's, it's not listed 365 times like tradition says it. I think it's 64 times. But that's enough times. You know, fear not. And boy, how much have we feared. Yeah. Have you ever feared Wanda? Yeah. God? Isn't that sad? For about four years. Huh? Yeah. For what? About four years after I came on her to the Lord and like the yeah. religious system. I feared God all the time. And see, I always taught that fear means a reverential respect, mm -hmm. but I still feared. I don't, I don't care how much I said that. I wanted that to be true. And that's what it really means. you know. But when it says fear not, he's talking about don't be afraid of me. But I was still afraid. I, I, I was one for many years that if you told me God was in that room and he wanted to see me, I'd be wanting to go to church first. <laughs> Can I go to church first and ask God to forgive me? Now, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I've heard people say, yeah, I would going to go repent. Well, he's right in there. Just go, no, I can't yet. i got to make things right with him. <laughs> the church has been insane, haven't we? Fear not. We just simply trust our Creator. You know, I told Donna back in, when uh, the Lord spoke to me in 1996 that we would never do without money the rest of our life if I would just turn my life over to God. And again, that doesn't mean we have a bank account that's got billions of dollars. But the Lord was showing me that He's going to teach me true supply in the future. But He met me where I was at. And that first year, we should have lost our home. And naturally, we should have lost our cars. We should have had to go get food stamps. I've worked for an entire year. We never lacked one penny. And the God didn't tell Donna that, though. He told me. You know, so... I shared with her what, but there were times that 
that she was wondering, and many times I just I would say, honey, remember what God told me, we can trust God. We can trust God. And, and she's a woman of great faith, probably better than me in many areas. But that, that, that one's hard when you're, you're, it looks like there's not going to be a paycheck next week and you want to say, honey, don't you think you need to go out and make a sale? <laughs> you know, and I, I appreciate that, but there were several times I did have to remind her, don't fear, don't, don't worry. And has it not been God's words true? Has it? Since 1996, we don't, we don't worry about it. And what a freedom that is. And now, I'm never going to worry ever about me doing anything that can separate me from my father. I've known that for a long time. But the, the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. The pieces of the Bible. And the, the, the biggest box top now is the love of God. Now Jesus is the love of God. Right? And grace is Jesus. Grace is Jesus. But I'm telling you, the box top, to put that puzzle together, it needs to say the love of God. Don't read this book. And it should be a disclaimer on the Bible. Do not read this book until you have a thorough understanding of the love of God. Amen. Then it's going to be a wonderful book. It's going to be, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. It's true. It's too, it's too easy. It's too simple. Now, how, how do we know that we never needed to be forgiven? First of all, the word forgiven, I put it on Facebook the other day and it bothered a lady a little bit. And I wrote some to her and I'm praying that she'll be at ease and... You know, if she really wants to hear the truth, listen for a while. But the word forgiven really means to drive that which hinders you from you. That's all it is. It drives that which hinders you from you. And so you just say, Father, I recognize that, you know, when I get a box of donuts and I eat it all in one day, that's not good for me. <laughs> Carl's just sitting there real calm. He doesn't do that. But I recognize that, and, and I thank you that you're, you're waking me up, that that's not what I need, that's not expedient. And so his spirit begins to speak to you and says, I'm your peace. Yes. I'm your peace. You know, I'm your peace. And you hear that over and over and over. And I've said this many times, when we think, whatever it is, and I, I know I joke about ice cream, donuts, so, but whatever it is that you're doing that you consistently go to for peace, it's important to start practicing and going to your father first. Yes. Go to your father first. When you start having those desires and you start hearing the need to whatever it is, start practicing. Because it doesn't work always right off the bat. I want my donut. <laughs> you know, I want my ice cream cone. You know, I've, I've had some real struggles lately with our one. seminars. Huh? I said you can have one. I can have one. <laughs> but not two in the same day. It's not good for me. But, but I understand, I'm, 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 put, I'm putting myself right there with people. And, but it's, it shouldn't be that hard with what we know to go to our Father first and say, Father, I want to just spend some time with you before I go, whatever that is. Not say, Father, you know, help me keep from sinning and all that, but just worship the Lord, sing a song to the Lord, talk to the Lord. And next thing you know, you might find out that He's the love of your soul, that He satisfies and what, what he gives you is an eternal satis satisfaction. And it just, it just, it'll free us. I believe that so much. So fear not. However, state, the, the Bible states, faith, without faith, it's impossible to agree with Father God. So if you don't believe that God loves you, then how can you fear not? If you don't believe that Father God loves you, no matter what's going on in your life, how can you fear not? So there again, the love of God has to be first and foremost in everything. Look at Hebrews 10, 29. Almost done. Hebrews 10, 29. How much sore punishment? See, the key word is the next two words. What does it say? Suppose you. See, he's not teaching a truth He's explaining this is how you believe, but it's not true. And we never even looked at that. I, I, I wouldn't doubt that people read, how much sore punishment shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot and left the suppose you all. We did in our mind because we didn't see it. So how much more sore punishment suppose you shall 
he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath accounted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, and an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So in other words, your, this, your punishment's really going to be bad. Mm. But the key phrase there is, suppose you. Yeah. This is what you think. Mm -hmm. Suppose you suppose this. I'm not agreeing with this, he said, but you suppose this. You suppose this because of your mythological influences. You're supposing this because of your false understanding of God. It's already done. They, they were already sanctified, but they were taught to opposite. I was taught to opposite. Yes. I'm telling you, 38 years in a, in a church, 10 years in another church, I was never taught that I was holy. Never taught that I was righteous. Never taught what it means to be in Christ. Never explained to me. Never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached. I heard Easter sermons. Heard Christmas sermons. I heard sermons about giving my money and working in the church and serving the church. It was all an enslavement, mess, enslavement yes. message. And I closed my spiritual eyes tight. Mm -hmm. And I never could see things spiritually. That's why I said cussing was a sin. <laughs> That's why I said no drunkard shall ever enter into the kingdom of heaven, and I thought that was going to heaven. That's why I was a sin conscious preacher. I didn't know I was sin conscious. Brother Hibbert came to me once and, and said, Roy, I never, I never realized how much sin conscious you are. And I should have said, well, you've taught it to me. <laughs> But it wasn't him. It was just the church system itself. Listening to church on TV and radio and growing up in a very uh, legal-minded church for 10 years. It just gets in you yes. and you become sin conscious. I want to be righteous consciousness. Amen. Amen. Righteous. How do we know we don't need to be forgiven in the way we think we need to? God said, who told you that? Adam fed from preachers that preached the knowledge of good and evil is what he did. Teachers that preached the trees mean teachers. And remember what I said, what, is it? what does the word tree mean? To make sure or to close the eyes. A tree, a preacher that preaches the tree of life can make sure you can stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. A preacher that preaches the tree of the knowledge of good and evil closes your spiritual eyes. And so Adam's eyes were closed. He, know, he forgot. Yes, he forgot who he was. Because I'm telling you, if you listen to that stuff all your life, the truth is you never knew who you were. And you can hear the truth and then go back and you're going to forget the truth. I've got a friend that used to come to our church all the time and I'm always saying, Honey, your brain is leaking. Because what comes out of her mouth now is the past stuff. Because guess what? She's getting fed that. And so you do forget. You forget. And God said, who, who, who told you that? Who told you that you were void in my life, naked? Who told you that you were a sinner or a sinner saved by grace? I didn't tell you that. So who told you that? Your religious leaders, right? Did God ever speak that to you in your spirit? No. Never. He never did. Who told you that you're perishing? Who, who told you that you're not in my image anymore? That you're separate from me? He would say, I never had anything against you. See, what we're sharing is the, the good news. And I, I don't think it can get any better than that. The only thing that can get better is our understanding of that. Yes. Yeah. But as we continue in the remaining of this, this book, we, we want to glean from Scripture now with this in mind. Paul's saying, you suppose these things to be true. I'm not agreeing with you. You need to write that down because that's uh, everything that we go through where Paul's in the epistles, he's speaking to people and say, you suppose these things to be true. I'm not agreeing with you. Let me explain the truth to you. Kind of like that feel felt found. You know, I know how you feel. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I felt the same way. I experienced that feel. I know you feel I felt the same way because I was, uh, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I taught the law. But you, you mind if I tell you what I found out? I had an encounter three, for three and a half years. I listened to God, and He took me through Scripture, and He revealed all these things to me. May I tell you? And be a silly person to say, no, you can't. But, but yet, yeah, people do. 
So he said, I'm just explaining these things. And that's what we're doing. Father God was never a God of anger, judgment, or reward. He's never rewarded me for anything I've done. He's never punished me for anything I've ever done. He's never held me back for anything I've ever done. He never kept ministry away for anything I've done. He didn't take my children away from me. He didn't kill my mom. He didn't kill my brother. He didn't, put, he didn't do any of that stuff. He's been lied about. We did it all. We brought it ourselves. He, he did nothing but brought life, light, and glory. And man took that and turned it into darkness, which means no understanding. So this is the real good news. Yeah. Amen? Yes. Good. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoy it. I love it. Wish we could start meeting every day. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun, Carl? <laughs> no, I, 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 would, I, I would like to teach more, but we, we, we'll get to in the future. But I, I teach a lot on the internet. But we, we appreciate you. Those on Facebook, uh, Global, uh, Global Grace Seminary. There's been some very interesting comments that we've been discussing, and I'm enjoying that a lot. Uh, they started our series on the Paul's Seven Pillars of Truth. I had a guy write me about it the other day, so I'm very excited about that. And uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'd be happy to help you. So we love all of you. Bless you. Appreciate you. Amen.